down here with you. Uh, since the lapel isn't working at the moment. How many of you brought your Bibles today? Let me see them. Hold them up. I believe this is the inspired word of God. How about you? Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our dear kind Heavenly Father, Lord, we want all of this service to give you honor and glory and praise. But now that we're here to open your word, we're asking for the Holy Spirit to teach us, to guide us, to open our hearts and our minds, that, Lord, we may hear you straight from the throne of heaven. In Jesus' precious name, amen. amen. I want to invite you to take your Bibles to the scripture reading. That's Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And I'm going to kind of take off a little bit where Ray ended up yesterday, last week, when he's talking about the fact that we need to, in these last days, glorify God. Our lives should exemplify who He is, shouldn't it? Amen. And so in Ephesians chapter 2, I want to come back to verse 8. The Bible says, For by grace ye are what? Saved. Saved. Through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. So if I were to ask you for a definition of grace, what would you say it is? What does that mean? Remember okay. that God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. That's true. That's true. Brother? It's something that God did that he didn't have to do. Okay, it's something that God did that he didn't have to do. That's very true. It's something you receive. You're guilty of it, but it's waived. Okay, something that you received even though you're guilty of it, it's waived. Or in other words, like pardoned. Something we, uh, something we get that we don't deserve. Something that we get that we don't deserve. That's true. Many call it unmerited favor. It's true. Yes? Power to go through something that you don't have the strength to do yourself. Okay, power to go through something that you don't have strength to go through yourself. Very good, very good. Now, all of these definitions, well, they're good, yes. The gift of God, absolutely. Grace is a gift of God. And it's interesting because the Bible says that by grace you're saved. Right? Amen. Now, I want you to hold your finger right here because I'm coming right back to you. But I want you to go with me to Luke. And I want to go to Luke chapter 2 and verse 40. Third book of the New Testament. Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2 and verse 40. Here we're talking about Jesus. They came and presented him. They showed him to Simon, Simeon. And they also took in, in uh, Anna saw it. But then notice when it comes down, in verse 39 it says, And when they had performed all the things according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. And the child, what? Grew. Grew and waxed strong in spirit. Filled with yes. wisdom and the grace. grace of God was upon him. Hmm. Now, I ask you a question. In light of our definition of grace, did Jesus need Satan? Well, he's a man, but he was perfect. And he, even though he clothed divinity to put on humanity, he still was fully divine. Amen. And fully human. Now, can you answer that? I don't know how to explain all that. But I'm just simply saying to you that Jesus never gave up his divinity. But you begin to look at it and say, okay, grace here says 
that, that God, what, how does it word it? The grace of God was upon him. So in light of the explanation that we all gave about unmerited favor and, and the need for grace, God did something for us that we didn't deserve. Did God need that? Did Jesus need that? Looks like it. Yeah. Well, grace is a person. It's not just a thing that floats around the air. It's a what? Grace is a person. Jesus is the grace. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's grace. That's, that's true, but grace, I want to, I if I may, disagree with you. No doubt, Jesus came, God sent his son. That's the gift that was given us. But grace is something much deeper than what we many times think of it as. And as we start this new year, that's what we're about to embark and I, and I tell you, I, I began to think, you know, it doesn't seem very long ago, we were in January 2020. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what my fear is, is we're going to be in January, or should I say the end of December 2021, in the same place we are now. What is going to change? And as many people do when they start the new year, they, you know, they make New Year's resolutions. And then they try to change things. But I want, to, I want to bring you back to Ephesians. Keep in mind what we just saw here in Luke chapter 2. Because the Bible says in Ephesians 2.8, For by grace you are saved. So come back with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Hopefully you kept your place here. Ephesians chapter 2. I want to read verse 8 again. It says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is a gift of God. Not of what? Works. Works, lest any man should boast. For we are his, who's the his referring to? Talking about Jesus, that's right. We are his workmanship, created in Jesus Christ unto what? Good works. Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So you begin to look at this whole scenario, and you begin to realize that we're saved by grace through faith. It's a gift. It's not of works. And yet, in verse 10 it says, For we are His workmanship, created in Jesus Christ unto good works. Yeah. What's it talking about? See, I want to submit to you that grace is much deeper than what many times we give it credit for or think of it as. Because grace, the word grace, is the word charis in the Greek, which means the divine influence upon the heart and its reflection in the life. So it's not just something that comes in, it's something that as it comes in, it does what? It goes out. And if you receive grace, you have not really received it if you don't exemplify it. Wow. So it's something that is not just a gift for you to give. So many times, when I do evangelism, I'll talk to members and members say, oh yeah, I've already been through those, you know, those kind of things. Well, let me tell you something. Every time I do a series of meetings, God makes a new connection to me that strengthens the truth. Amen. But we ought to take and want that revival. We ought to want to know the truth. And I always say, well, if you know it well enough, then why don't you take a few nights? Yes. <laughs> Amen? Amen. I mean, if you don't know it well enough to share it, you don't know it well enough. That's right. And so many times we're afraid of that. But, but I look at this passage of Scripture... And I see the fact, it almost reminds me, you know, the, the story of Jesus is a potter, and we are the clay. clay. And when we look at being in his workshop, and him molding us, and aren't you glad he does it a little at a time? If God sent us a fax of everything that needed to change in our life, what would you do with it? I'd probably wad it up and throw it away because you'd look at that list and say, there's no way. But as God begins to build us a little at a time, 
we become more and more and more like Him. Amen. After all, what does the Bible say? Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. I have people that even happen to someone say, oh, you know, we're going to have to just be sinners until Jesus comes and then we can take it. Jesus can fix us when he comes. I don't think that's what the Bible teaches. Amen. The Bible teaches that he is going to help you overcome. Yeah. I mean, you look at the letters to the seven churches in Revelation and what do they end with? To him that overcometh. To him that overcometh. To him that overcometh. You know, God wants us to be an overcomer. Not just when He comes, He wants to be us to be an overcomer now. Amen. Now you begin to look at this whole idea of being in His workshop. Keep in mind that definition of grace. The divine influence upon the heart and its reflection in the life. Now go with me to Revelation. I want to go to Revelation, last book of the Bible. And I want to go to chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. And I'd like verse 7. Revelation chapter 19. I call this the hallelujah chapter. And if you read the whole chapter, you'll know why. But notice in, in verse 7, the Bible says, Revelation 19 verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath what? Made herself, ready. made herself ready. How can you make yourself ready? I will tell, I'll be the first to tell you, you can't do it alone. It's that gift. That grace that God bestows upon you, but remember, that grace that God bestows upon you isn't just to get you off the hook. Because Jesus isn't trying to just get you into heaven. He's trying to fit you for heaven. Amen. Many of us today, if we went straight to heaven, we would not be comfortable there. Oh. And that's a sad thing. I mean, when I stop and think that the disciples and all the people, the converts of, of Paul's day and John's day and, and all them, the Bible says that they took the, Bible, the the Word of God, the message of Jesus, to the then known world and their, their generation. They began to look for Jesus to come. That's why Paul writes to them in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting with verse 1, he talks about the fact that, no, 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 no. In regard to the second coming of Jesus, now this is the New Nelson translation. In regard to the second, regard to the second coming of Jesus, there's got to happen, something's got to happen first. That man of sin has to be revealed. The one who opposes all and, and sets himself up to be God. So he's, Paul is saying, listen, be careful, be careful. There's some things that have to happen. And I would say to you, remember, remember, there are some prophecy that has to be fulfilled before Jesus comes. But I will tell you this. It could happen like this. I think, I think it's actually, you're right, it happened before our eyes. The movement is there. But you begin to look at this whole idea of grace. But notice, his wife hath made herself ready. Verse 8, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the what? Righteousness of who? Saints, now wait a minute. I thought that our righteousness was as filthy rags. Mm -hmm. It is. The key there was our. But you remember the definition of grace. The divine influence on the heart and its reflection in our life. You see, what happens is as God gives us grace, He grants to us that divine favor, that, that character of Christ that molds us and makes us and helps us to be more like Him. And then what, is, what happens as a result of that? It goes, it goes out. When, you're, when you fill a pitcher of water up with water, what happens if the water stays on? It overflows. You can't help but share the love of Jesus when you're excited about it. Amen. I love new Christians. 
I love new Seventh-day Adventist Christians. Because they're wanting to tell everybody. And they come in and whether they said it wrong or done it wrong or they're just so excited to tell Jesus. I remember one time I was doing a series of meetings and this beautiful Catholic lady, she came, she brought her two grandkids and she was she was excited about what she was hearing. Now, she went through, this was the third series that I know of that she was going through. And one night she said to me before the start of the meeting, she said, Pastor, she said, I got my friend Rita and, and I wanted her to come. And I asked her to come and I'll but beg her to come and she wouldn't come. She said, I was born a Catholic. I was raised a Catholic, I'll die a Catholic. And I started to say something, and she says, so I told her, oh, Rita, I'll miss you in heaven. <laughs> now, was that a good thing to say? <laughs> no. I, I said to her, I says, who makes you the judge? Yeah. Now, I understand you've learned some things she hasn't learned. But I'm glad I'm not the judge, aren't you? I'm just simply saying she was so excited to want to share the truth that she didn't go about it quite the right way. We need to learn how to do it in a winsome way. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Amen. But I want you to understand it's God's grace that brings righteous works out of you. Amen? Amen. Not of yourself. Go with me to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. And verse 33. I love this chapter. Because early in the chapter, Peter and John are, are faced with a dilemma. They've been chastised by the priest. But I always like it in verse 13 where it says, and when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Amen. And I thought, what an aspiration for people out there when they look at me that they can take note to know that I have been with Jesus. But I want to come to verse 33. It's after that all that whole experience. And in verse 33 it says, And with great what? Power. Power. Gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great what? Grace. Grace was upon them all. I want you to catch the connection between power and grace. That word power there is the word in the Greek dunamis, which is where we get the word dynamite. And what it literally means is miraculous power. And so here you begin to see that correlation and that connection between receiving miraculous power, that divine influence on the heart, and the reflection it gives in the life. Obviously, John and Peter were reflecting the work of Jesus, what, weren't they? Mm -hmm. But you have to ask yourself the question, does God give grace to each one of us? Amen. Well, sure, absolutely. <clears throat> and, and you know the amazing thing about it, he loves us so much, he gives the, us that influence even when we don't reflect it. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that's not his will. His will is for us to reflect it as Peter and John were reflecting it. I want to take a look at this word dunamis for just a moment. Take you to a couple scriptures here. And, and, and by looking at the way the word is used, you can help to understand a little bit more about the word. So take your Bibles and go with me to Romans chapter 1. This may be this next book to the right. Romans chapter 1. This may be a scripture that you've committed to memory. And I like verse 16. 
Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. The Bible says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power, it's the what? Power. Power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. What does that scripture tell us? The gospel of Christ has power. Okay. The gospel of Christ has power. What kind of power? For salvation. Okay, for salvation, that's true. What does the word power? The word power here is the word dunamis. And the word dunamis means miraculous power. So God has given us His Son, and the gospel of Jesus Christ is all that is needed to be able to share God's love with the fallen world. If we look at Jesus, now our Bible study is important, sharing the truths, they're important, but let me tell you something, if they don't fall in love with Jesus, none of that matters. It all starts with that grace, that divine influence on the heart and its reflection in the life. Let's look at another one. Interesting one. Go with me to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. And I'd like to come down to verse 17. Luke chapter 6, starting in verse 17. If you're there, please see Amen. Amen. And he came down with them and stood in the plain in the company of his disciples and a great multitude of people out of all Judea and Jerusalem and from the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon, which came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And they that were waxed, vexed, rather, with unclean spirits, they were what? Healed. But notice the next verse. And the whole multitude sought to what? Touch him. For there went out what? Virtue out of him and healed them all. What is virtue? Power. Okay, power. It's the same word, dunamis, that we found in our last text in Romans 1.16. So he's saying, listen, they wanted to touch him because they knew miraculous power came from Jesus. What is it that the Bible says will happen to those that in the last day are giving the gospel message? That's right. Power will come upon you. Receive the Holy Spirit. In the gospel commission, it says they, they will heal. And, in, and so you begin to look and realize that this word virtue here is that same miraculous power. Now let's take that and go to another passage in verse 8 or chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. And I like verse 43. This is a story that of the woman that had the issue of blood. I think we're mostly all familiar with that. She had an issue with blood for 12 years. Luke chapter 8 verse 43. The Bible says a woman having an issue of blood 12 years which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him and what? Touched the border of his garment. And immediately her issue of blood was staunched. And Jesus said, what? He touched me. When all denied, Peter said, and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude throng thee and press thee, and sayest thou who touched me? I mean, you can understand, catch yourself in your mind's eye with the picture that Jesus, as he is walking down, has people all around him. They're crowding his every move. He's every step, they take a step. He stops, they stop. Everybody is brushing his shoulders on either side, maybe bumping into his back. 
So you can understand the strange request when Jesus stops and says, Who touched me? A whole bunch of people have touched you. What in the world? But you see, there's something that happened that the average touch didn't get. Notice it continues on. Verse 46, And Jesus said, Somebody hath touched me, for, for I perceive that what? Virtue. Virtue is gone out of me. What is that word, virtue? Power. power. Dunamis. Miraculous power. In other words, it wasn't just like somebody brushed against him, somebody touched him and it moved his shoulder, his arm. He felt that healing, miraculous power leave him and go to whoever touched him. And of course, then the woman comes realizing that she'd been caught. But isn't it amazing? All she had to do was touch the hem of his garment. It's not like she had to grab his arm or his head or rub his head or... Hmm? She believed. She believed. Absolutely. She had faith. Let me take you to one more. With me to Ephesians again, chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. And notice with me in verse 20. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. The Bible says, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the what? Power, power that worketh in us. What's that word power? Dunamis. What does it mean? Miraculous power. When Jesus comes and gives us grace, that's the divine influence, the miraculous power that works upon our heart and our life that we may exemplify or show forth the praises of Him who's called us out of darkness and into His marvelous light. Hmm. So you begin to realize that God wants us to begin this next year in a new way. It's kind of like electricity. Right? You come in here and you flip a switch. Or push a button. Or hit a remote. I don't know how you work. Or you're, you're, uh... You know, in today's world, there's so much you can do with lights. When we left Michigan, we set up our some of our lights so that they could actually be controlled from down here. Bethany just, I don't know how to do it, but Bethany gets on the internet and somehow she's able to reschedule or change them or turn them on or off or whatever she wants to do. It's amazing what you can do, but the reality is, is even if you flip a switch, do you see electricity go to the light bulb? Now, if you take the wires off and you touch them both, you could feel it. But the reality is you don't see it. What about gravity? Do you feel gravity? <laughs> when you drop a hammer, you could you could feel it. When you get out of a swimming pool. Okay, get out of a swimming pool. There's times. But let me ask you a question. Do you realize that this world is spinning in such a way that it keeps us where we are? Yes. What would happen if God stopped the world? I, I can't even imagine what would take place. But what I'm really trying to get is, is this. And that is the fact Jesus described when he was talking to Nicodemus that the Holy Spirit is like the wind coming. You don't see it. You don't really hear it. But how do you know the wind is blowing? You watch, you see the results. You see the trees. So it is that we can, we can see the workings of the Holy Spirit upon our heart by what? By the reflection of His grace in our life. Amen. Right? That miraculous power that is transforming us to be more and more like Him. Mm -hmm. So, why do we need grace? Oh, without Him, you can do nothing. You see, when you look at it so much 
in, in light of what we're talking about today, it's much more than just a, a ticket to go past home. It's more than a ticket just to go to heaven. It's actually that miraculous power that's working in our hearts to help us be more like Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah is right.